Hello, my name is Jonathan Clark, also known as DJ Bolivia, and uh, I'm here with another series of tutorial videos uh, relating to music. This time we're doing uh, a series that I've had a lot of requests for and that I've really wanted to do for a long time now, and that is the use of Ableton Live software for a live performance. Now, I did a series about a year ago about how to put together a DJ mix using Ableton uh, for the purposes of something like a pre-recorded radio show or something like that. But that's, you know, that's got limited applications. You're not going to put together your mix ahead of time if you're doing a live DJ set. You want to actually perform live. And so that's what this series of videos is going to cover. Now, uh, basically there's different types of software that's used for DJing. Now there's examples such as Virtual DJ, Tractor, Serato, Final Scratch. Um, I kind of group all those together because those are specifically used and designed for DJing. Ableton is a different product that's kind of in a class of itself, a class of its own. It, uh, it's basically a production suite. So with those other packages, you cannot put together a track. But Ableton is actually a full-fledged um, production platform. So you can make tracks uh, from start to finish. You know, drums, bass, synths, leads, vocals, you can record all that sort of stuff. Fully, fully capable. But it was really well designed because even though it's designed sort of production, it was also designed with DJing in mind. Okay, so today Ableton is our subject. Uh, I'm breaking this into a four-part series instead of one massively long video because, you know, there's kind of logical chunks to this whole process of performing live. So basically this first part is going to be talking about the theory behind Ableton, um, some of the equipment that can be used, and just a generic overview, and it'll bring in a couple other topics from the DJing industry that you need to know about before we get into specifics. Um, once you've watched all four of these videos, you'll kind of understand everything from start to finish, whether you're using a very simple setup, uh, like a laptop going out with just a single line out, to a set of speakers, um, right up to more complex things like using uh, using controllers, using mixers, that sort of stuff. Uh, like I say, I'm going to bring in topics from other parts of the industry. Uh, I'll refer to some of my own videos that I've already produced because that'll save time and those are more comprehensive anyway. Now some of those videos are going to be overkill for some of you and some will be necessary. When I'm producing this series and all my stuff, you've got to realize that I'm kind of working with a very um, broad range of needs from you guys that are watching it. Okay, so some people have very little background. Some of you, this is, uh, this is mostly stuff that you know and you're only watching this kind of as an overview to tie everything together. And that's the problem. When I was learning how to do all this stuff with Ableton for live performances, I knew a lot of this stuff. But I didn't really have a single source from, from beginning to end to teach me, you know, how all the different pieces fit together. So hopefully this is useful to, even to those of you that know a lot about audio stuff, a lot about music, a lot about DJing already, to tie everything together. But I also have to uh, keep this fairly simple for the people that don't have that much experience. Okay, so for some of those other videos, uh, I'll recommend that some people, but not everybody, watch them. For others, everyone has to know the stuff. We'll cover that in a minute. Now, on the same note, some of these videos, I realize that it's going to be very simple stuff for you. So if you're already, you've, you've played maybe a couple shows, you've got a little bit of basic experience as a DJ, then you're only going to want to skim through some of those videos if you watch them at all. For others of you, if this is new subject material that I'm referring you to, uh, you'll probably, it can get pretty complex, so you'll probably want to watch those videos a couple times. If you do, watch them once as an overview so you kind of understand the big picture, and if you don't think you're comfortable with everything that I talked about and don't know it intuitively, watch again a second time, but take notes as you go. Okay, so, but you've got to learn the basics before you know, you've got to learn the basics like how mixers work and how beat mixing works in theory before you'll really truly understand some of the stuff that I talk about in parts 2, 3, and 4 of this video series. There's a lot of chatter in the industry about Ableton 
and whether it's uh, it's being a real DJ. You know, if you're using computers to help you, does that make you less of a DJ? Well, it's kind of a silly argument, to be honest. I do a lot of DJing on CDs and on vinyl. I learned as a, as a vinyl DJ. And probably 97% of the shows that I've played over the last 10 years have not been using Ableton. But you've got to look at Ableton as a tool. And I think for a lot of people, it's a good thing to learn instead of learning beat mixing on vinyl or CD. I mean, if you could do everything, yes, then you should do everything. But for some people, going straight to Ableton has benefits. And for those of you that are already established DJs, there are massive, massive benefits to using Ableton. Um, basically, it's just a tool. It can help you improve your skills as a DJ. And if you wanted an analogy, um, think about lumberjacks. You know, when lumberjacks started out, they were using axes to cut down trees or crosscut saws. Then all of a sudden, one day, the chainsaw came along. And it's a lot stronger, faster, and it does a lot of the work for you, for the lumberjack. If somebody is a lumberjack and they start cutting trees down with a chainsaw instead of with an axe, does that mean they are less of a lumberjack? No, of course not. You're just using a different tool to do the job. So some of the advantages of DJing with Ableton, first of all, it's probably a little bit less expensive because you don't have to buy as much gear. I mean, you have to buy the software and you have to have a laptop. And there are certain optional pieces of equipment that can help you out. But it's pretty expensive buying decks and mixers also, and music on, uh, on vinyl. Now, another advantage, if you're using Ableton to help you control your beat mixing, that gives you more time to focus on other things, like programming, which is picking the right music. Stage presence, okay? If you're playing for a group of people that, say you're in a huge, huge party or something, some of the people may not even be able to see you so they're going to judge your performance based on what they hear. And you have far, far more flexibility with Ableton than you do with traditional, uh, traditional media. Like if I'm, if I'm DJing on vinyl and there's a breakdown coming up in the record that I don't want to play because it's too quiet, I don't want my dance floor to lose some of its energy, on vinyl, my only option really is to mix into another record, let that breakdown play through or lift up and remix in, and then come back into my record once the breakdown's over. You know, that's fairly complicated on vinyl. Um, with Ableton, you can pretty much just click, boom, skip right over the intro, uh, skip right over the breakdown, or double back and play a section over again. You cannot do that um, on linear media, like a, like a piece of vinyl. So Ableton, definitely some big, big advantages to it. Now, when you're playing on Ableton, you also have a little bit of flexibility with the way that you produce a sound, because you can do remixing on the fly. Now, a lot of Ableton DJs don't do that. You'll just have pre-purchased tracks, and you'll be mixing those together like a normal DJ would on vinyl or CD. But if you happen to be a producer, and you've got some of your own tracks that you've produced broken down into component clips. Like say you've got the kick drum, the bass drum separate, pads are separate, so on. You don't have to play all those different components as a single prepackaged mix. You can pick different bits and pieces, you can change the order of stuff, and so basically you're creating new songs, new, tr new re remixes on the fly. And so that's a huge, huge advantage with Ableton that you could never get in traditional media. Okay, so as far as disadvantages, well, obviously it's a little bit more fun sometimes playing on uh, vinyl, but, uh, but Ableton's got some big strengths. Okay, so in our different sections of this series, uh, the section that we're watching right now, I'm going to be covering, I'm covering the theory, and I'll touch a little bit on the types of equipment that you can use. The second section, uh, we're going to get into the actual use of the Ableton software, I'll give you the basics on how to navigate through there, you know, the 25 cent two minute tour. Um, but most of that you can learn elsewhere. 
but what we'll do with part two is we'll set things up, we'll set up a project, a DJ set, in Ableton, and we will do an example of how to route that out, assuming that you only have a single stereo output as, uh, as your uh, option of playing things. So it's like your, say you've got a single, you don't have an external fancy sound card, and you're just playing directly from the laptop, it's going straight to the speakers. Uh, or maybe not speakers, unless you've got a powered speaker. That could be the same thing if you're going into, into a crossover, into a compressor, into a single channel on a soundboard, into a single channel on a DJ mixer, but basically thinking about the option of only having a single master output. No queuing, nothing fancy. Okay, so that's part two. In part three, we'll take it a step further and we'll talk about these optional pieces of equipment, headphones, um, headphones, sound card, MIDI controller, mixer, and how each of those can be integrated into the set. And then in the fourth part, we'll get into, into the most professional setup. We'll get into a, uh, a unit that combines several of those optional pieces and, uh, and go from there. Now, in order to in order to really understand this stuff, um, different DJ programs, some of them you can do your mixing on the fly without any previous preparation. For others, a little bit of prep it at home ahead of time really helps you out. With Ableton, you absolutely do need to prep your tracks ahead of time by doing what's called warping them, adding warp markers and that's mandatory if you're going to do beat mixing. Now, do you know what beat mixing is? That's critical. Um, any, I'm assuming that most people watching this are, the majority are going to be using this for dance music, for music which is uh, referred to as four on the floor, constant kind of kick drum beat, um, constant boom, 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 boom. So like house, techno, trance, dubstep, drum and bass. Uh, all that sort of stuff. If you've got any of that kind of music, you don't really want a song to end because the dancers out on the dance floor might take that opportunity to go, Whew, let's go to the bar and get a drink. And you want to keep them on the dance floor. Okay, so beat mixing is useful because it lets you merge two songs together, makes it sound natural, make sure they blend into each other, and it kind of gives you keeps up the momentum on the dance floor. It's like the, the music never goes away. So if you understand, I'm gonna put a link down here right now on YouTube. If you are an experienced DJ and you've played in public before, then you understand beat mixing. You don't have to watch this video. If you have not DJ before, if you don't really understand all the background behind beat mixing or beat matching, then I recommend that you should probably click on that link and watch the video about beat mixing first. If you do that, this video that you're watching now is going to pause, you can come back to it. Um, that other video about beat mixing, you don't have to watch the whole thing. It's basically about beat mixing on CDs. The first part of it talks about the theory. Once you get through all that stuff and you get to the point where I start, where I get to the CD players, I say, okay, let's do some of this practice. Um, you don't have to watch anything from that point on because that's just practice, whatever. But if you don't understand beat mixing fully, you might want to go check out the first part of that video right now. Okay? All right. So let's assume now at this point you understand how beat mixing works in theory, even if you've never done it before. Uh, I talked about the need to prep your tracks in Ableton before playing by warping them. Okay? Warping a track, mandatory, mandatory, so important. You have to know how to do this if you're going to be able to DJ live, perform live with Ableton, okay? It's, it's kind of a complicated process if you've never done it before, but you'll catch on to it quickly. I would say for me, because I've done it quite a bit, um, a typical dance track might take me 45 seconds to warp, so it's not really that hard once you understand how to do it and you've tried it a few times. Um, it might take you several minutes at the beginning until you're used to it, but uh, 
Anyway, it's a fairly easy process once you get used to it, especially with music that's that's 4-4 four, four beats, simple stuff, dance music. Uh, you will have to be aware that you don't have to warp every track just before you play it. You're not going to be warping during your G DJ set. This, this is something that you do ahead of time, at home, and Ableton saves a file with a .ast extension that stays with your music on the drive. So whenever you play the set in the future, Ableton already knows where the warp markers are, where you put them there when you prepped it. Okay, so this is a once-only process. Anyway, here's a link for the warping video that I put online um, a year ago. If you, if you don't want to watch this warping video right now, that's okay. You don't necessarily know how to, need to know how to do it right this minute before you watch the rest of this series, but you will need to know how to do it before you can play live, okay? So either watch it right now so you understand it, or watch it after you've watched all four parts of this series. It doesn't matter. Uh, the next thing that you need to know is mixers. Um, you have to know what a mixer is. Um, there's basically two main types of mixers. There's sound boards, which would be used in kind of live, uh, live performances like bands and stuff. And there's DJ mixers, and they're very closely related. All the functions are basically the same. It's just kind of the layout's maybe a little bit different, more channels on, an, on a live soundboard mixer than there would be on a DJ mixer. Uh, if you have DJed before in public, you understand how a mixer works. So, if you haven't, here is a link to a video about understanding the basics of audio mixers. That you definitely need to understand before you go into parts 2, 3, and 4 of this series, okay? Because you have to understand what the different channels are for, you have to understand what the gain controls are for. You have to understand why there's a master or a mains out that goes to your speaker system, to your dance floor. You've got to understand why there's a booth or a monitor control and why that's different from your mains. Um, you've got to understand how to set up your headphones for queuing. And there's all kinds of things that you have to understand. Now, I'm going to use three different mixers, I think, in parts two, three, and four of this series. But also, Ableton, and pretty much every DAW, every audio production software package out there, probably has a mixer within the software, okay? So, it's interesting because with Ableton, let's say you don't have any optional extra equipment, then it's got all these things in it that let you do everything you need to to perform. Ableton has a mixer on screen. Ableton can let you do queuing stuff on screen. Um, Ableton lets you control things on screen instead of using a MIDI controller. Okay, But when you start getting the extra pieces of equipment, it might make it easier than using Ableton's internal stuff. But anyway, Ableton's mixer, if you understand how normal physical audio mixers work, you'll also understand how Ableton's internal mixer works. And that's going to be necessary because you're going to have to understand routing paths, you're going to have to understand send returns and inserts, that sort of stuff. Um, I mean, you don't have to necessarily understand all those things in a lot of detail, but you kind of have to know roughly what they, what they mean. Okay, so if you don't, go watch the mixer video right now. That one you have to watch before any of the other parts of the series. If you've DJed in public before, you understand mixers, don't watch the video, okay? So at this point, I've touched on the fact that you can have four optional pieces of equipment that help you out. Let's look at those. Number one is a set of headphones. Here is my sturdy old set of Pioneer HDJ 1000 headphones. Um, you've seen me using these in a bunch of my other videos. These have... Uh, lasted for almost a decade. You can see they're almost worn out. Um, I've had four sets of these. That's how much I love these. Um, they did have a problem with breaking because this is kind of a plastic assembly and you can see where I had a, a dime and some crazy glue and a bread tag and some crazy glue to patch these back together instead of throwing them out. That's because I love these. 
if you are looking for a set of headphones, uh, I'm not going to say that you have to get Pioneers. If you are getting high-end headphones, good headphones, then I would recommend that you think about, check out the Pioneers, because I love them. But, like I say, don't get the 1000s, get the newer model, the 2000s. They have, first of all, they have a detachable cord, so if you break your cord somehow, it's easy to fix, whereas these ones, I don't know how I haven't managed to break these over the last decade. Uh, also, the 2000s, they have the same drivers and everything, so good quality sound, but they have a titanium band over top, so you can't break them like I have with my 1000s. Even if you don't get high-end headphones, get a set of headphones. Make sure that yours has this type of connection. This is, it's called a 1 8 inch jack. Um, it's called a male jack because it looks like a penis. And uh, see how there's two bands there? That means it's a stereo jack. Um, basically, the ground carries, well, you, you've got three different things. You've got the tip, you've got the band, and you've got the sheath. And so basically one carries the, uh, I mean, you can think of it like, like positive negative ground. Okay. Anyway, um, make sure you get a set of headphones with one eighth inch because that's usually what will plug into your computer. If you're going directly into a computer, some mixers do have an option for an eighth inch jack. However, most mixers, most professional audio equipment uses a larger jack. This is called a quarter inch, also male. And um, I think the, the 2000s, the HTJ 2000s from Pioneer, actually come with this adapter. If you get a set of headphones that doesn't come with the adapter, get the adapter, just cut screws in or clicks on, and that way you've got the option to go into either size of headphone jack. Okay, so headphones might be important to you. Um, second choice, second option, which uh, you might want to get to make your system more powerful if you don't already have one, is, a, is an external sound card. This is a USB-based sound card. This one's made by Focusrite. Uh, the model is the Scarlett 18i6, which stands for 18 inputs, 6 outputs. Um, this one is not going to be ideal for our purposes today, but that's good in a sense because it'll show one of the downfalls of... Uh, of a lot of the sound cards out there. Basically, this one, it says it has six outputs. In an ideal situation, let's assume that you want to be DJing and sending your music out to two different channels of a mixer. Okay, each channel needs to be stereo. So really, you need four outputs going to the, uh, going to the mixer, going out of the sound card into your mixer to get what you want. You'll need a left and right output for one channel, left and right output for the other channel. Now, <clears throat> this one says it has six outputs, and if we only need four, what's the problem? Well, in the specs, the headphone jack for monitoring is labeled as three slash four. So this is taking, even though it's only a single receptacle, it's taking up two of my six outputs because it's a stereo feed to the headphones, and there would actually be a headphone preamp in here, okay? Looking at the back of this particular thing, it's got a SPDIF output and input, but the output alone is stereo, so that's going to take up two more of my six outputs, and that only leaves two, and I really want four if I'm DJing properly. So the problem is, I don't know if you can see this, but the, uh, the these are labeled one and two, each of these, although it's a tip ring sleeve TRS quarter inch um, receptacle, each one I believe, and we'll find this out later in the video, I think it only feeds a mono signal. So in a situation like this, this would be great if I'm only going to a single uh, output. So you know, if I'm routing my master, my mains signal out through here, this could be my left and right side of my master output signal going to a sound board. But if I'm trying to go to two separate channels on a DJ mixer at the same time, it's not going to work because each of these is mono. Um, I mean, yeah, I guess I could DJ in mono, but that's not, that's no good. Okay, so be careful if you ever buy a sound card, 
um, make sure that it's got enough outputs that are either stereo outputs or, or it's got twice as many mono outputs to cover your needs. If you end up working on a mixer with four channels and you actually want the ability to use all four of them simultaneously, you need either four stereo outputs or eight mono outputs. Okay? You don't have to use all four simultaneously, but as a minimum configuration, you should have enough, you should have four mono lines out. Okay? Now, this is good because this illustrates the point that a lot of USB sound cards are not uh, perfect for DJ applications. You'll have to spend a little bit extra to get one that meets your needs. Okay, so be careful when you're buying something like that. Uh, I guess that's all we really need to say about the external sound card right now. Oh, except the uh, connections. Okay, this one, this one uses, um, it uses a USB connection. Okay, so one end of the USB cord into here, the other one into your computer. There's different USB specs. USB 1.0, I believe, uh, was about 12 megabits per second throughput. That was the original USB. It was quite slow. It's pretty old, like early 90s. Okay, then USB 2.0 came out much, much faster. Instead of 12 megabits, it's rated for 480 megabits per second. Okay? Um, eventually, recently, more recently, USB 3.0 has come out. It's extremely fast. Uh, that's, math, that's a design spec of 5,000 megabits, or 5 gigabits. Um, so that's more than 10 times the speed of USB 2.0. Now, um, these are the theoretical, uh, th theoretical specs. Now, if you want actual sustained throughput, throughput levels, you're probably only looking at 60 to 70% of those speeds. But either way, that's probably way more than you need. Um, certainly, USB 3.0 would handle an immense amount of bandwidth, and USB 2.0 is good for most simple applications. Okay. Now, there's also sound cards out there like my Motu 828. That one is a Firewire-based system, uh, which is falling out of favor. Firewire, there's two different main specs. It's called Firewire 400 or Firewire 800, and that's also megabits per second. So you can see that a Firewire 400 is actually slightly slower than USB 2.0, which is 480 megabits per second. And even Firewire 800, which is twice as fast as 400, is nowhere near the speed of a USB 3.0. So I think USB 3.0 is the wave of the future, certainly. Uh, so, so basically that's your options on sound cards. Now let's look at MIDI interfaces, MIDI controllers. Now here's an example of a MIDI controller. Uh, you probably would have imagined that I'd use some sort of controller that resembles the traditional mixer style layout so it would have faders for the volumes on the two channels and it might have knobs up there up top for for EQing or whatever but this you know there's all kinds of different types of MIDI controllers and this will work just as well as anything else and there's different types of controls on a controller this one is the uh, I don't even know what this would be called um, it's some sort of trackball device you can have um, big rotary knobs like a pitch wheel a jog wheel. Oh, jog wheel actually is usually a circular thing that can spin in either direction, kind of like a turntable. You can have sliders, faders. Um, you can have controls like this, a panning potentometer, also referred to as a pan pot or just a pot knob, and basically that goes from one to another level. Um, you can also have knobs that don't uh, have start and stop values, like this one for example, will spin forever in either direction. You can set up knobs on your, uh, or buttons on your controller, perhaps as a start stop for a control. Anyway, so this just, this is a, this is one type of MIDI controller, a keyboard that we're going to use, and I'll try and show you some other ones also. And of course, finally, uh, we'll talk about mixers, integrating a mixer into your system. Uh, okay.
So that's quite a bit of uh, information to overload, but that gives you a general idea of what we're doing with this series. So for the next three parts, part two, we'll focus on using Ableton and doing a very simple single output, no cueing to a sound system. Part three, we'll bring in um, multiple channels, external sound card, MIDI controller, and cueing. And part four, we'll do all that kind of combined on a more professional level. And actually, there's going to be an unofficial part five. You don't have to watch it, but uh, for each of these parts, I'll do a, you know, a quick couple minutes of examples. But after I'm done all that, I think what I'll do is uh, next week I'm supposed to have episode number 155 of my radio show, Subterranean Homes at Grooves. Uh, next week is, yeah, 155th episode. So I think what I'll do is I'll produce that episode using my gear after I do part four of this series. So if you feel like watching a longer uh, actual hands-on example of putting together a live performance that I record, then you'll be able to do that, okay? I'm gonna be using Ableton Suite 8 in this particular group of videos. I know that 9 is already out there and available, and it's got some pretty nice features, a few uh, improvements from 8. But 8 is, 8 is gonna be fine for what we need to do today, and I figure it was more important to get this set of videos online first before I really get hands-on completely familiar with 9. So probably within a month, I'll do a video talking about the differences between 9 and 8. Um, so this series itself is a little bit more useful in the future. Now, one other thing I should mention too is I don't get paid to make these videos. I, I do them because it's fun. And uh, I really appreciate all the feedback that I've been getting from around the world from people watching these. Um, if you've got questions, post them under the video on YouTube or post them on my Facebook fan page because I can, I can type out much longer answers. It's easier to have a conversation on Facebook. So don't be scared to post there. Don't post them on my YouTube channel. It's short and I never look at that. Okay, and uh, if you do find that these videos are useful and you think some of your friends might find them useful, I'd love it if you could either um, post, post them on message boards that you use, post a link to this video on message boards, or post it on your Facebook page or your Twitter account to help spread the word. Um, that would really help me out. Appreciate it. Or if you happen to go to my main website and listen to some of the live recordings I've, uh, I've got posted online there from different shows that I've played. And if you have access to a promoter who does bookings and is looking for DJs, don't be scared to give them my name because um, maybe I'll get a chance to come play in hometown near you at some point in the future for some of you. So for now, that's the end of the introduction, part one. Make sure before you go on to part two, you understand how mixers work, you understand the theory behind beat mixing, and you understand um, how to warp stuff. Or, or if you haven't done it yet, I guess you could do that part at the end. Okay, let's go on to part two.